Hi guys, and welcome back to the technical track. Um, I hope you had a good time during your break and you're hungry for more insights. So uh, we'll start our second talk segment with a session uh, aimed at shedding some light on a series of uh, common user requests in, the, in uh, the business intelligence and data world. Uh, ING Tech's uh, Romania's Remus Popescu, uh, who is a proficient development engineer in the data management area uh, that has almost 10 years of experience in the BI field, uh, will discuss advantages and pitfalls of, the ser of servicing such requests, incorporating the prevalent goals of bringing value both to users and to the BI environment, uh, Remus, welcome to the Big Data Week remote stage. You have the scene. Thank you, Pate. Hi, everyone. Give me one second to share the presentation. And I'll start the story. Let me minimize. I hope you can all hear me well and you can see the slide. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for joining in this uh, virtual setup and uh, letting me be your host for the next uh, 30 to 35 minutes. I'm going to present to you disrupting the conventional with uh, right back. But um, before I dive into the topic, before I give you all of the insights, let me give like a 30 second of one minute presentation of myself. Um, because I've been in the BI world for the last nine, nine and a half years, and there were a lot of situations where I bumped into this topic. I've tried to have multiple roles. I started as a reporting specialist. I've continued as a developer. I've also had the project management and uh, business analysis roles. So I can say that I have kind of a multiple perspective, like a 360 view of the BI world. And as I said, the right back topic or the need for people to modify, alter, insert data in various ways came back over and over again, and especially, let's say, in the last year, year and a half. So that enticed me to Google this information around to see more of what's behind this topic. And this is how I uh, got to the right back word and to the right back um, scenario. And this is a bit of my story. I know that not everyone here is like a BI developer. Maybe some of you are developers from different areas. Maybe you're just working with data and analyzing it. Maybe you're more on the business side. Even if this is the tech track, you can still be there in the audience. I cannot see you, unfortunately, but uh, I, I hope you're you're there and you're interested. And in order to make this like a baseline and start everyone from the um, from the same uh, layer or from the same level, I've scavenged the internet, to be honest, for like a definition. What is right back? Because for many of us, right back can mean different things. For us in the BI world and for me, it's the action to change information in the source from within the context of your BI environment. This means that if I create a dashboard or a report, people, not immediately, but in a few moments, <laughs> will try and uh, request for like, can I modify that number? Can I work with that parameter? Can I enter a comment? And various things like this. And wherever, whenever um, developers heard this and whenever architects had this raised to them as a topic, a lot of red, red lights come popping in and it was considered like a taboo subject. And to be honest, that only enticed me more to Google and to search more information um, about this. So today I'm going to try and guide you a little bit to the evolution of the BA world. How did we get to write back? We're going to look a little bit on game changers, like what are the actual requests? How do they sound? Maybe you're already bumping into them and you don't really recognize them as right back. Um, if you're um, in the need of making something happen, of building a solution, what are your market offerings? And um, at the end, pick one of the market offerings, one that's, let's say, more innovative and more new. Look a little bit at advantages, look a little bit of pitfalls and what do you need to avoid in order not to fall into them. And at the end, we will just uh, top it off with um, a quick demo and let's uh, let me call it like a proposed solution from my side. I'm going to use Power BI and Power Apps to get some data from the BI environment, from the dashboard to database. And um, if everything goes well, you will hopefully see how this uh, runs uh, live. But further ado, let's get a little bit into the evolution of the BI world and my personal perspective about right back and my personal perspective of people wanting to alter data is uh, that um, maybe willingly or knowingly or unknowingly, we, the business intelligence people, the data people here in this room, we kind of steered our business towards those kinds of requests. 
So if we look at a BA project, I can uh, split it up into little pieces in these four major elements. We, in order to have a BA project, for sure we need the sources. We, you can't have anything without data. You need the database or the data lakes. You need the cubes or the data marts so that you can do pre-aggregation. And in the end, of course, the product that you're also proud of, your dashboard, your report, that's gonna steal the show for everyone. One thing that it's usually looked, uh, not looked upon or um, forgotten, it's exactly the arrow be, uh, beneath all of these. Conventionally, this happens into one single flow. Data flows from sources to dashboards, and it's a unidirectional flow. This is the conventional way of doing things. But in the last years, <clears throat> with the last request, there's more and more focus on the dashboard side, and we can even decompose dashboards into two major components. We can decompose them into data, and we can decompose them into visualizations. And if we look at the first dashboards, um, they were mostly static. You can even find these today, let's say. Um, they're all the requests that end up with, I want to print this, or I want to export this to a PDF, or I want to put this in a PowerPoint. All of these dashboards are static. The main focus is the database. If you have the data, you can make this work. No clicking around, no modifying data, no modifying visuals for this step. For the next step, we, the data people, we kind of offer them interaction. So we let the user click around. More advanced dashboard solutions kicked in. They can click, they can filter, um, they can see related information based on two different graphs and so on. Is this um, a change of data? Not by any means. Is this a change in the visualizations? Slightly debatable, but I would say if it doesn't change the structure, it doesn't change the visual. So you're just filtering out. It's the same kind of view that you see more or less. Then a nice step uh, came in, collaboration. It's the one that I, in a way, like the most because it's the place where me and my team, the developers, um, meet the business people and we kind of really gel and really sync. We are building the model, we're building the cubes, we're building all the information and pre-aggregation there. And the business just taps into that cube. They can use Tableau, they can use Power BI, they can use Click, and they they make the visualization happen with all the nice insights, with all the nice information and colors on the page. This still doesn't change any data, so no right back at this point, but we started to give them a bit of a uh, taste of changing visuals. So they start to play around. They can change from a template. They can even build like their own stuff, which is pretty cool. The last step is contribution, and this is where things get hectic. This is where right back kicks in, and this is where the most changes occur. Contribution means that at some point, if a user can change everything except the data, guess what he will ask for next? Can I add a comment? Can I play with a variable or with a parameter? Can I insert a transaction in there? Maybe I want to um, mix something up. Maybe I want to correct something. I don't know. And the main problem and the main thing that considers this from a technical perspective, a taboo subject, is the second arrow that you see below. The single directional flow, now it's a bidirectional one. Data is flowing also from the dashboard towards our database area or to our data lakes. And we also need to store in some way whatever the user enters in there. And we need to make sure that it's stored correctly, that it's consistent information and so on. So from a technical perspective, this is where the doubts start kicking in. But um, again, these are only risks. We can try and look at mitigating them, but we need the second part of the story. We need to put a little bit our business hats on, and we also need to look from the request side, from the business person. Try and put yourself in his shoes for a little. And I'm going to try and ease that a little bit for you. I'm going to have three examples of um, write back type of requests. I'm going to have three real examples from my career and also three little warning signs of what to look for. The first type and the first um, <clears throat> request, maybe not so common, but it exists. It's um, a user, maybe in the form of a product owner, maybe in the form of a businessman, asking you to insert a row or to insert information. Mm, tricky, tricky thing to do. From a real 
uh, scenario from a real world situation, try and um, imagine yourself as being um, part of a store, a really successful store, of course, that tries to sell multiple products and it tries to sell them all over the world. And just as luck has it, today, Tuesday, around this hour, free and something Romania time, uh, you will need to gather all that data into one single report, one single pager, mentioning everything that was sold for this week with a nice trend line. More often than not, that would work, but there are some cases where either one of your partners or one of your stores will not send the information. Maybe there's a problem in transmission, maybe they just forgot, and maybe they send it, but you know that typos can occur. You can have like an extra zero or a different limiter, and that's gonna impact your end result. That's gonna impact your dashboard. And if the meeting is right at four when we finish, um, most of businessmen will say, I cannot go with that report. You cannot go to your manager with like an incomplete set of data. Everything from my developer um, perspective screams that this needs to be fixed into the source. And if you're a really lucky guy at a really lucky company, that might happen in one second, might happen in one minute. So you don't really have a problem. But um, in the real world, fix uh, things don't really go that fast every time. So there are cases where because of legally bound issues or because of people being on the other side of the earth, things might take a day, things might take more than that. So people will come up with a request of asking you, hmm, can you put in there like a form so that at the highest level, I can insert like an approximation or a guesstimation or a rounded up value that I know for sure it's very close to the correct number just so I can maintain the trends, just so I can still calculate like a decent forecast. I'm gonna flag it accordingly to everyone seeing it, but I wanna be able to show something different than a zero or a blank. Tricky, tricky thing, <laughs> tricky request to answer, if I would say. And uh, the main warning that I would have out of a multitude, let's say, of warnings and the main disruptor that this might cause is the data ownership. If you ever let someone do this, if you ever let someone introduce a correction or introduce an approximation or a value of any kind, um, be very careful if that person owns up to that data. They need to own up to the information, to the correctness of the information and to the timeliness and all sorts of that thing because it's no longer a source-based number, it's a human-based number. In the end, sources can be wrong too, humans can be wrong as well, but at least we're trying our best to have the most accurate or the best number in there, or most closely to the accurate number as we can. It might be a job for a write back type of PBI. We shall see. A second example, and I've bumped into this um, multiple times, and if you are from the business intelligence area, you might have seen, seen or worked at the, um, the practical cases as well, is editing a cell. What do we do in the BI world? Well, mostly I'm creating KPI dashboards. So a dashboard full of metrics, a dashboard full of indicators, because companies are steered that way and decisions are made based on indicators. And I'm not a perfect guy probably my company and yours is not the perfect company in the world. Sometimes, very rarely of course, you will get a metric that's red according to targets, according to thresholds, and um, the request kicks in. Can I put in there a comment? Can I put in there like an explanation? Maybe I would like just to type in the change number or the incident number that's raised to fix all of this blunder. Again, uh, sensible information, and maybe you're all screaming at the screen right now, go to the source system, and maybe that will entice you even more if you see the data lineage warning there. But um, think about it, it's a KPI. It's uh, probably an indicator that, that comes from a multitude of sources, all bunched together, calculated, aggregated, and presented very nicely in origin purple on the screen. So you might not be able to have the luxury of just go to an IT department or an IT guy and say, build me a field. Most often than not, that field ends with the BI guys, with the BI database or the, with the BI data lake to hold that comment either forever or for a uh, retention period of X amount of years or months. So we're getting more closely to like a write back scenario. Example number three, it's a really interesting example for the times we're living in right now because um, you know the whole pandemic, you know the whole virus is the whole reason I'm not with you right now in a room and I'm all alone here and probably you're 
all alone or with um, your families. And um, what does that to a company? What does that to a manager? It brings a lot of uncertainty. So maybe the next time when you're sitting with your manager, when you're discussing options of what to do next or what action should you take, maybe it would be really neat to have like a variable or to have like a parameter in the front end element that you can just change. For example, let's tweak a little bit the exchange rate. Let's tweak a little bit the margin or the discount or whatever. So that, that we're ready not for one possible scenario, but the really multitude of scenarios that the last six months thought of can happen. Even if unlike there is a chance, so we need to be prepared. Some of these functionalities are already in tools like Tableau or Power BI or Click. But right back will bring a bit of a more insight or a bit of a more um, history to everything. Maybe you just don't want to test everything. Maybe you also have the consent of your team to store all of those tests and all of those scenario. So maybe in a like a um, aggregated dashboard, you can put in there the top three or five or ten tested scenarios. So you know what your team is testing for. You know what your team is expecting. The interesting part, you might also see what your team is not expecting and what you're not prepared for. So you can also take action there as well. And you can only do that with write back. If it's just something in a tool that the moment you close the tool disappears, well, disappears as well. You can also um, put like a history or like a uh, table of versions with uh, all of the possible results of those scenarios. That might be um, interesting to gain like an interval of trust. So things might be this bad or things might be this. But again, all in all, these are just um, requests. I have I had them for real in the past uh, years or so, but in the end, it's up to you to like scale and measure. Um, do I want to take the risk? Do I want to take the warning and try to mitigate it? and also try and make this happen, or do I just stay conventional and I uh, reject the request? If you would just reject the request, I wouldn't uh, want to hear only that because my presentation would kind of end here. But if there is someone in the room that uh, would like to be a bit more innovative and try right back or is in the need of trying right back for his solution, um, I need to show you some market offerings. What does the internet, what does the technology, bring to you and how can you make write back or writing data happen? Surprise. Uh, there are a lot of things on Google regarding this topic, even as, as taboo as it seems. And I try to group them down into two main categories, in and out of sync, um, just to have a bit more structure so I don't pile up the screen with tons of um, search results. Um, in sync for me, it means that it can set either on top or really, really close to your existing um, IT stack or IT um, department right now. Mostly this is for like big companies. You already work with a vendor. You already have a dedicated, dedicated stack. You already have large IT departments um, working in your companies. For the out of sync part, it's mostly um, if you're a smaller company or you don't have a consistent stack or you're gonna see in there, it's like an honorable mention, but we'll get to it in due time. I've also tried to like categorize them a little bit. I won't go through all of the specifics here. You can check the screen if you feel something is interesting and we can go in more detail in the Q&A. But uh, I try at least to mark if they're right back specific. Uh, I know you're interested in if they're tech complex or not. Uh, interested in cost, of course, and maybe level of customization. I'm gonna start with the, with the in sync part. And before I reveal my first candidate here, uh, try and think about me. I'm coming from ING Tech. I'm coming from a bank environment. So the main option that I will give you is something that needs to go like hand in hand with the security and with the lowest risk possible that you would assume happens in a bank. Because I work a lot with audits. I work a lot with uh, regulatory reporting, with central banks. So there is no room for error, if I would say. So if you want to do write back and if you have, let's say, all the money in the world or you need to do it the best as possible as you can, build your own form, build your own app. You can do this in-house. You can get some developers. There's going to be significant cost added to this. You're going to need to build your application or your form, store it somewhere, have like a server. I'm not saying new stuff for you, but it's the most, uh, the most safest way, the best way to do it. If you're working with um, external customers or if you're working um, in, in my field, 
You can use technologies like ASP. You can use Java or JavaScript. But personally, I wouldn't sit too much and dwell too much on this topic because um, we only have the 30, 35 minutes. I can talk about this for two days if you want, but I'm just going to bore you. Let's go a bit to the more innovative and let's say a little bit more new approach. You can have like a more integrated approach. I put in there in brackets Power Apps, but you have options uh, outside Microsoft Word as well. There are some add-ons in Click and in Tableau, and there are some add-ons in various other um, BI um, products. You can just, um, if you work on a stack, in my example, Microsoft, you can just um, go to an application called Power Apps. You can um, have a lower cost. It's easier. Even I can code into it. It's like low code. If you are, um, let's say, um, proficient a little bit at uh, dragging and dropping for your Power BI's and uh, you know your way around the Excel formulas, you will do just fine in Power Apps and you can easily learn the, the new stuff. And there are similar examples at um, other, um, other vendors. Um, it's e easy to put on top. And if you have something like for your local team or for your department or something that will not go, let's say, external to your company, you can build in there like a small app. Think about your mobile phone and those types of apps. And you can integrate those in Power BI. And I'll show you just that in the demo in just a couple of minutes. You can also do the other way around. You can put Power Apps into that mobile app of some sort or that uh, web app. So it's up to you how you want to prepare your environment. So it has a medium to high level of customization. If you want to build like alongside your architects and alongside your IT department, these are the options that I would uh, advise, but you're not stuck with these. If you're like a smaller company or if you want to um, innovate like a new product, there are a lot of custom solutions out there on the internet. You just need to Google them or not to promote or demote uh, anyone during this talk. Um, a lot of TBD is there because it's, all, because it's all up to you. It's all up to the um, contract that you sign or what you want out of that application. Um, but it is an option. So if you want to do it, go for it by all means. And um, the last example, the second one in Out of Sync, it's the true example where um, I kind of regret not being with you in a room and not seeing everyone um, on, on this presentation because it's more like an honorable mention and hopefully it will put a smile on your face. We still have Excel. Remember, if you want to get data into a database and if you're talking with a BI guy, you're mostly going to hand me a file. Might be a text file, might be a CSV, might be an Excel, right? There are a lot of Excels running around my company. There are a lot of Excels running around your company. It is a way of doing it. It is not the fastest way. It is not the best in-house way, but it is a way. So I need to put it here. It is an option. Um, but um, for future presentation and for the demo, I didn't came here to show you of Excel and loading Excels into a database. You probably already know how to do that. And you know that Excel, it's such a double-edged sword that it's so wonderful and so dreadful at the same time for a developer. So I will just stick to, let's say, the innovative part. I'll stick to Power Apps. I'll stick to Power BI. I'll continue with this example forward. I will um, set for a couple more minutes into advances and pitfalls, and then we'll um, get to the demo when I'll show you a solution. So advantages and pitfalls. I have um, a little scale here. I've tried to put some uh, pluses and minuses. And um, what can I say? Uh, for the for the good parts or for what brings uh, extra, uh, it's in comparison with all of the other um, options that you saw previously. Uh, if you look or if you compare to building your own source system, kind of speak, or building your own app by yourself. It's way more cost efficient to just get a platform, drag and drop uh, stuff um, onto the screen or onto the canvas, and way more easier to implement if you think about uh, Excel-like formulas rather than if you think uh, object-oriented programming. So it's much of an easier entry. It's low code. As I said, even I can do it, and you're going to see it in a minute. So um, yeah, it's more easy to get into and it's more easy to get creative. You can also get some trial accounts. You can try on your own. So there is no uh, major barrier. It's a limited time that you can play around. If you compare it to like out of sync or external solutions, it's way more quicker than going to an external vendor, the, um, discussing all the details. Also, it's way more quicker and more safer than Excel. 
because you know how Excel wander around. And even if you're really, really fast, you still need someone to complete it, drop it on a SharePoint, drop it on a drop zone or somewhere. So it takes some time and takes a few minutes to, for the SQL database to catch it up and load it and so on. You're going to see in, in my example that uh, with this mix of applications and the Power BI itself, we can just do something uh, almost live. There's one or two seconds delay, but um, it's, it's bearable. For the last, uh, last part of the theoretical aspect, I'm going to um, talk a little bit about the negative. And I don't want you to view me or leave this presentation with me as being the bad guy or showing you the negative part. But remember at the beginning, remember the title. We're talking about disruptors here and right back can be a really big disruptor if the project and the way you're doing it is not really, really thought of. An easy way of getting around most of the headaches, I would say, is try and uh, focus on these three words in, in the purple um, boxes right here. Segregation performance and control. What do I mean by segregation? Uh, because you're flowing, uh, you're getting data and data is flowing from manual side uh, and also from the source side, you're always going to need to segregate the two. And this is my big advice to you. Think about database or data lake layer and also think about dashboards, reports and cubes. Uh, try and separate them. I know it's kind of a hard word or a difficult word to, to digest, but I like to separate, segregate them in um, pure elements, like pure tables, pure views, and let's say tainted views. Same thing with the reports. If I have a view or a store procedure that uses both types, I will just consider the result as being tainted. Uh, it's safer to do it that way. Um, the, and also you'll be transparent with the, with the user. So he knows what he's looking at. He knows um, what he's basing his decisions upon. Then performance. Think again about the two arrows. You're flowing data from both sides. You're going to see you're refreshing the dashboard a lot more oftenly than you should if right back wasn't there. So you need to make sure that the database can hold and you need to make sure that um, uh, Power BI or the um, a BI environment can hold. And also control. Um, we're, we're all humans, me as well. And um, I tend to not make up my mind rather quickly. So I put in there, I write the correction. 10 minutes after the presentation, presentation, I'm just going to go in there and correct my correction or adjust the adjustment. So people will tend to do that as well. We're all human beings. We need to cater for this. So you need to have like good uh, versioning. You're going to need to have like a good history of what's going on in there. I'm going to give you a bit more examples in the demo. So again, don't really um, be frightened by these. Treat them as risk and treat them as mitigating risk as best as possible and try and uh, take them into consideration from the, from the beginning or as much as the beginning of the project or of the change because it's really, really important to take into consideration segregation, performance, and control when you're working with uh, with write back and with write back, write back data. And I will not bore you more with the theoretical part. I will try and quickly switch to my Power BI view. Give me one second for the full screen. And I will try and guide you around my example. Um, my example again consists of that um, that store. If you remember it from from the um, previous example, we're selling stuff, and um, I like to be balanced. We're selling lots of things: sports, home, health, food and beverages, whatever. I made like a small uh, database. I try to keep it small just so it's the uh, most transparent to you, and I just um, put it on Azure on the cloud. And they've created a Power BI dashboard with ING colors, of course, uh, the orange and the purple, and post it here. And uh, if you look at it, um, maybe you won't see anything weird or anything different from the beginning, because probably you work with Power BI, probably you work with different uh, visualization tools. Uh, but if you look a bit more closely, probably some of you noticed this little box in the bottom right corner. This doesn't really look like an app you would see in Power BI, correct? Because it isn't made in Power BI, it's made in Power Apps. I can open Power Apps, I can drag and drop in there either a form, either a title, uh, either some buttons with uh, some nice uh, logos. I use the default ones, but I will let you be creative. And I can simulate an input form. 
I can, um, let's say, make that form fit the width and the length that I want in my Power BI, and I can just publish it with my Power BI. So I am in a Power BI environment. I can do everything that Power BI can do with clicking around, refreshing, and so on, but I can also insert elements. And um, because it's 2020 is the pandemic, I try to go one year back, be a bit more stable. And um, even so, I try to dumbly recreate like a partner not sending his data or not sending his stuff. You already can see here a few of my tests. I wanted to make sure that this works. Let's hope that I don't get a timeout or anything different. And I can use my form to input an ID. There is mandatory to have like a primary key. There's mandatory to have an ID. Otherwise, the, goal, the whole system goes boom. Uh, but we're in 2020. I hope everyone is using primary keys in their um, tables and in their databases. You can query the table that you want to insert this row into, and you can get a list of like distinct elements. You can put it under food or beverages or whatever. You can query all of the months that are available. We can put it under April here, and we can make another adjustment of 7,000, and we can just click Add. So I have a 77 record. Um, you will see that everything kind of starts to refresh. It's for a brief moment. You will see that the number of invoices went by one. You will see that I have a food and beverages item in my table. I made it specifically for visibility, this table. I know it's not the most beautiful or the most enticing or insightful view, but it does the job. It's the idea that I've put the line um, here represents my segregation element. So I tried as best as possible to make it transparent to all of you and to all my users. You have the orange line, the pure element, if you recall it. So you can still see there's a major gap here. Someone didn't report, someone missed a zero or something happened. But you can also see the dotted line, the purple-ish color, where you can see all of my corrections right here. Lines are the most um, visible, they catch your eye. You can do columns, you can do whatever um, other visualization that you want and that's available either in the visualization tool or whatever. So don't don't let me stop you. I just wanted to, to put the most visible ones in the front. Uh, and also remember, again, segregation. You always can compare. You can compare your source system value with your Remus value. You can call it or not because it's only me entering data in here right now, but it's a manual correction nonetheless. So you can make an educated decision knowing exactly what you based on your, or on your decision. So um, try and keep that, try and keep the segregation element. If we look at performance, uh, you probably didn't see it because it was kind of fast, but all of these refreshed when I clicked add because it refreshes the Power BI as well. So be careful about extra load on your database, because this is actually an insert statement. Be careful about the load on your Power BI server. If I was just showing this to you, it would have been one load and maybe a few queries here and there if I click something. But for sure, it wouldn't refresh everything because I clicked this add, this add button would never be here. What you can also do, but um, again, I'm in a virtual setup and I'm uh, slightly limited. You can also take this um, application or visualization out and you can make like an administrative pane. So you can leave your main page with only um, the values, with only the data, and you can make like a secondary uh, page for uh, corrections or inputs or comments or whatever. But um, I don't have the luxury of sharing two screens. So here it is and one in the, all in the same page in one page. And for one minute, if I may, to show you the scenario example uh, and uh, talk to you a little bit about control and a little bit about performance, and then I will open it up for Q&A. You can create multiple pages. You will see that when you initially open the page, um, you will see the slight difference, slight uh, different loading pattern of the Power Apps, um, I don't know, sky blue that was there rather than the instantaneous power bi you can be very creative with these apps if you saw something in a mobile app you can add it in here you can have a drop down you can select this to a table you can have like a form you can select or link this to a different table 
So there are various and various options. Uh, for this example right here, what I wanted to test is, let's see, let me um, imagine that you are my um, audience, you're my managers, you wanna take a decision and you wanna change uh, some discount percentages and you really, really wanna be giving them. So you're gonna just switch from 10% on your members and credit cards to something like 20%. Again, slight refresh, slight uh, loading. You're gonna see the two splits again. You're gonna see the discounts, you know exactly what you change and you're gonna see the difference from 20 to 10% or for 10 to 20 and all of the, the reports. You can uh, do this, it's gonna be instantaneous, but in scenarios like this, you're gonna see that credit card value is permanent. So I still see the 20 there every time I click. So try and be careful about control. And this is um, um, something very important. I tend to make up my mind rather hard. So maybe I want 15, or maybe I wanna switch it back to 10, or maybe I want different and different scenarios. Try and think about versioning, try and think about um, maybe linking my input with my corporate key or with my ID so that um, you don't mix them around. So you have as much control as possible over um, over what's going on because people will just enter data and enter data and they will never stop if you give them that amount or that level of freedom. And um, um, because we're uh, running a little bit out of time here, I'm gonna stop the demo right here. Uh, I'm gonna thank you so much for listening to me. And I'm gonna end with the hope that um, both the, let's say a little bit more boring theoretical part and the quick demo and the quick changes that you saw right here live, um, spark a little bit of creativity. And next time you bump into a writing data request, into a write back sort of request, you have like a starting point or a better starting point than you had like 30 minutes ago. So thank you very much for listening to me and being a, a nice audience. And I will uh, switch back uh, to my moderator because I would like to open it for Q&A. &A. Mate? Thank you very much, Remus. It was a very, very interesting talk. Um, we have one question for you. It's how did the GDPR affect ING Tech's uh, management of its customers' data? Well, I'm not sure how yeah, data or write back related is this, but yeah, we were affected as all of the other companies because we need to make sure that we only store data that the customers allows us to store. And in this case of write back, if you're working with customers, of course, get their consent that you are gonna not only let them play with the scenario, but also save what you're gonna save what they entered in there. So get like a written consent or notify them about this. If it's within your company, you can just discuss within your teams more of a, it's still a formal consent, but it's easier to discuss it. What I would uh, use this for within the team is again, I can for, so I can also intervene and tell them, well, oh, you forgot the scenario or try and look at everything that you didn't look because maybe there's something important there. So again, GDPR is impacting, but not as much as uh, the idea, any other topics like um, my personal data or anything else. Remus, thank you very much. Um, guys, that was uh, Remus Popescu's talk from ING Tech. Um, I would kindly ask you to switch on to the next session uh, and we'll uh, get back to you in a couple of seconds. <laughs>